This meeting, this meeting of the TAC is being conducted via remote participation. Um, it looks like the first order of business, hi everybody, happy July. Um, the first order of business is to um, look over, I think, I didn't the minutes, um, right? The minutes. So the I, I did have like a few edits to them um, and I'm happy to send Amber the updates, like if people agree. Okay. I, was just, I was just looking through them right now. Um, do, Kim, do you wanna pull them up or I can pull them up? Yes, I have them now. I'm not sure I... Um, okay, I can, I can pull up my copy because I was already like marking it up a tiny bit. I'm not sure that I'm able to do that. Are we able to do that, Guilford, as like meeting attendees? We can share. Yeah, we can share screen. Okay. Oh, yeah, I could too. Okay. Um, but let me, I'll just pull mine. Okay. Um, all right. So the first minute. All right. So this is the first one. Um, and I appreciate. So you guys just see my minutes, right? Yep. Tons of other screens. Okay. Um, I'm going to actually close a couple of these. Okay. Um, yeah, sorry. Okay. So um, so the minutes I thought looked great. You know, Amber always does a good job. I just had a few, like, clarifications just that um, that with the safe routes to school stuff um, that, you know, it was both Christine and myself who had met with the board member. And did the walking tour of Wildwood and what we were like assessing, you know, the walkability. Yeah, that's just not, a, oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Assess the walkability. Bikeability. Um, and that it's actually, we're both writing that. <laughs> so okay, great, yep. I don't want to put it all in Christine. I was supposed to give her more of a draft than I did before this meeting. Um, okay, so then we also had the meeting with the Safe Reach to School coordinator. So she's the Western Mass coordinator for the four Western Mass counties. Coordinator Lucy Freeman Bell and the representative from the school, Deborah Smoreland. Um, yeah, so this is all going all the way back to May. So we've done like quite a bit since then. And um, there was some general support. And, um, and so the day after that meeting, that we met with Deb, there was also a meeting of the district leadership team for the district and Deb Westmoreland followed up with them, which that meeting includes the principals and the assistant principals and some other district leadership and there was general support. Great. So then the other thing with the um, minute edits were just um, that part of what I remember from the discussion and may was that actually the the thing wasn't that the TSO decided to make a change and make more of the spaces metered and less permitted, but also, but also the whole it was introduced to have the dual metered permitted spaces, like that seemed like the main change. To me, um, Guilford, is that right? And so, <clears throat> and that the park side back in Angle Park is still going for it, but will not be introduced until. I mean, the, you know, the larger project is done, including widening the road, I think, right? So part of it is that there's limitation. All right, so, and um, minor improvements could be done by the fall. And yeah, so at the council, I mean, the council actually voted on the minor improvements too, if we wanna mention that. Um, so then, I mean, the rest of it looked fine to me. I just highlighted that in the notes that uh, talked about the Amity Street improvements. Um, I guess I would just clarify the, the section that it covered, right? It was like both sides of the street up to Lincoln. Is that right, Guilford? Is it from, I don't know. No, it's from, I don't know, I walk it all the time. I guess it is. It is from, until Lincoln. It's yeah. to Lincoln, yeah. But where does it start on the town side, like the town center side? Does it start uh, at that North, little street uh, behind the library? It starts at, right. So it starts at North Prospect Street, South Prospect Street. Yes, Guilford can't yeah. hear you. 
I still can't hear him. Can anybody else hear him? Nope. Oh. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes, we can. It's that Zoom Teams thing. Oh, you know, Zoom Teams. Yeah, I got I hear you. So yes, that's right. Okay. Two, okay. Um, and then my question here, just with the notes, is just that it says the Mill Lane multi-use path is next, which you can already see that's happening in Kellogg Street sidewalks. Um, and that's just the section. That's just the near town section, right? Like up to the um, up to the driveway of like the housing, the public, the senior housing. Is that right? I had a question about why Mill Lane was in there because Amity Street improvements doesn't really. Yeah, that, that's a good Mill point. Lane is down in another location. Yeah, so that's it true. Seems like that should be B, you know. Well, actually, I guess it could just say here. So it could improvements. say here. It, it could just say, it could just say sidewalk improvements, right? Because yeah, sidewalk improvements, sidewalk upgrade on Amity. Yeah. Street and then. Yeah, so. And Mill Lane should be. And then added. they're all just like their own, like you back them out here. Yeah. Yeah. Like that. right. mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Um, and then Pomeroy intersection. And so, I mean, that was my only, um, those were my only comments. Yeah. So. Great. And I guess I didn't know too, Guilford, if, I mean, it says here that it said that the project is potentially going to be bid out Pomeroy Village, like before the end of June. Do we want to just leave that in the minutes as is? I didn't know if you had like an update on that. Well, these are minutes from last oh, meeting, fine. not this meeting. It's actually even the May, May, May meeting. Yeah, so, <laughs> it's even longer. Okay, so let me, I'll stop sharing that screen. Yep, and so we also have the, um, yeah. if you want to just approve all the minutes, we can also, um, the, the June are, ones, yeah. June minutes. Um, and Christine uh, I, has her I, hand up. Yes. I think it's remaining up potentially. I put my hand down because oh, you I, just put your hand down. I blurted out my comment before. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Do we want to just look at the June ones fast too? They were shorter. I think yeah. if you remember, the May was the one that we went through a lot of items. So let me, I'll just share the screen on the May items. You mean the June items? On the, sorry, June minutes, yes. Um, okay. And with those, um, I just wanted to just clarify again with Safe Reach the School that Chrissy and I are still compiling the summary report. We did collect the data. Um, and, and just that, I mean, the big thing with this, this thing about, well, one there, are, we did find at all the schools, even though sometimes I hear otherwise from school or town administrators that the numbers of kids walking and biking to school at each of the three elementary schools was pretty small. Like it was about 10 to 15 kids at both Wildwood and Fort yeah. River. And it was about 20, 25 kids at Crocker Farm in part because Crocker Farm has that neighborhood that's literally like right next to the school and there's a direct path. Um, and so one of the things that was mentioned to us by the principals and we've now met with them, Chris, Tina and um, Lindstrom and I have met with them a number of times, is the, or at least once, um, is that the, um, that, you know, with COVID, that more parents were asked to drive their kids instead of bus their kids, and that the bus numbers are still lower now, and there also are fewer kids walking and biking too. I mean, we did our counts on days where the weather was good and things. So the counts that were done with the elementary school building committee meeting were those pedestrian counts were in the middle of the winter, but ours were really almost the same. So, mm -hmm. um, and I don't actually know if this is true about the district rules have changed regarding school pickup. I don't know what that means. Chris, Chris do you know, Lindstrom? Uh, this comment it, that um, I, yeah, Amber I mean, had included. I think we could say, um, we think, district rules have changed regarding school pickup, but we need to, we need to find out more. So we're just, this is actually referring to the bus ridership. Is that what we're saying? 
Is that what you mean? Yeah, I think so. I mean, uh, this was at a meeting. Right. Obviously, I wasn't here at this meeting. Oh, yeah, that's true. Most but true. yes, I mean, I so sure. the concern is that um, right. uh, with even if you live within the, the mile and a half walk radius of the school, you're still getting picked up um, kind of automatically by the bus. Yes. But we have yet to confirm that and need to have... Yeah. Meetings to do that. And then, um, and right, and we did have a meeting on June 28th, just to clarify that that's June. Um, and the meeting actually on June 28th, that's the one we had with the principals too, right? Um, with the, it's going to be held with the district reps, the state for the school rep, and, you know, school leadership. Um, Bill Laramie was there too from the police. Oh, right. School leadership. Right. A well, we didn't know that. I mean, this is like in advance of the meeting, right? So, but we can say representative. Yeah, I think we knew early yeah. who, oh, okay. who was going to attend, including Bill. All right. All right. So, we can say. Um, and it's not really to see what the district could apply for so much. It's more to just talk about the results of what Christine and I saw and to talk about next steps, including potentially applying for funding. Is that how you would recap it too, Christine? Right. <clears throat> Findings. Discuss. Next steps. Next steps. And then, and then all I did there is I just corrected the spelling of McClellan. That's like my other highlight. That's it. And then we didn't have any referrals, and that's it. So okay. Then, okay. Did did you have um, something, Bruce? Oh, I was just going to. What would you say, me or Chris? I don't know, Bruce. Did you have your hand up? I'm sorry. Okay. I, yeah, I was just going to say we need to vote on these separately because I wasn't present for the main meeting. Okay. That's oh, fine. okay. Okay. All those in favor. Yeah, I say something. Oh, yes. yes. Sorry. We should have asked for in this. The second set of minutes. Yes. A meeting on August 21st, and that's a Sunday. Oh, okay. Um, this is the last part of that minute. Yeah, yeah. Let me just check that. Thank you, Chris. Um, we'll just make sure. So we were just talking about the, fir the first and the third. So wherever that is, yeah, okay. It's so, uh, sorry, that would have been August 18th, yep. which I, th I think we had decided not to meet on the 18th. I'm not available on the 18th. Yeah, we're not either. Okay, next meetings. So I think we'll just say- August 4th. Yeah, so it'll just be August 4th. And um, I'm, I'm interested, I mean, if some people are interested in meeting in the middle of July, I know, um, Kim, you're not available then, but- right that I'd be interested in talking later in the meeting just about some of the safe routes to school stuff because Christy and I are working on the write-up and it'd be nice. I think it'd be nice to get some feedback. So if we wanted to have like a subcommittee or something to have like one official meeting just to discuss that, maybe that's an option, but. Um, Andy has uh, his hand up. Yes, uh, I had a couple things real quick. One is that I don't think you need to have been at a meeting to vote on the minutes of the meeting. So uh, it's fairly common from other committees that okay. I've worked with so that uh, you can vote them as black as you want. The other thing is, is that during the, uh, as you were talking about the minutes, I was looking through the committee handbook and I did not find anything that indicated that 
um, somebody whose term has expired can carry over voting authority one way or the other. It was silent on the issue as far as I could tell. So my recommendation would be, I think it was, if I recall, it was Bruce who raised the question, but whoever did to note um, the votes of people whose terms have expired and consult the town clerk um, about what to do with the uh, votes before the minutes. I doubt that you're gonna have anything that is gonna be so close that it's gonna make a difference, but that seems to be probably the more cautious approach. Thank you. So, so I guess, Andy, I'd like to just respond to that second comment is that it seems like with the TAC, typically we have people whose terms have expired. Some people are being reappointed and some aren't. And I think that's not unique about committees. I'm not, I understand that you're looking at the rules, but I don't think this issue is one that is just with the TAC alone. I know like my current appointment, the last time it was approved by the council is that my term expired last summer. My, I, my term expired June, 2021 and Kim's technically expired June, 2020. Yeah. And so we have been waiting since that time to be reappointed um, and we've still been conducting business as usual. And if we weren't able to do that, we would not have a quorum and we would not have had, had any meetings in this interim period. So just as a practical matter, I mean, perhaps the council wants to clarify how that works. But what I've been told from the town manager's office is that until reappointments are done, that existing members are able to continue on. Okay, if the town manager's so. office has told you, because as I said, bef noted before, this is not a council appointed committee, it's a town manager appointed committee. The council only, uh, votes uh, to confirm and usually it just proceeds. So I, um, it is a town manager. No, but I think it's still a good at question just to perhaps clarify that. Yeah. You know, just so um, like through GOL or somebody. As right? to whether the minute taker wants to just note that for uh, the votes by individual, just if you seek clarification. Okay. She should go on. This is worth the time to go. Okay. No, absolutely. Okay. Okay. So um, unless there's any further discussion, I think we will um, vote on the consent agenda, both of the items at once, um, both of the minutes um, with the um, suggested uh, uh, changes as, um, as we uh, watched on our screen. Um, all those in favor all those members in favor i see hands up unanimously oh, okay so hands. that is five of us so all of those are approved um unanimously <clears throat> okay thank you and so our next item of business is public comment but it looks like perhaps there is no public with us let's see um nope okay so um we next have the um, request from the TSO for our feedback on the Lincoln Avenue parking restrictions. <clears throat> okay, so I had invited um, Jennifer Todd, the council member for the district, district three, where this is, um, where this part of Lincoln Avenue is to come to the committee. Um, she did write a memo to the council that was in the, information that I shared earlier and it did go to TSO last week and they discussed it for most of the meeting. Um, so Jennifer, if you'd like to just make like a few comments about why, you know, I know that the council took it up last year and why it's come back to the council and then um, the TAC can discuss. Well, thank you. Um, and thank you all, you know, thank you for um, inviting me and letting me have a few moments. I, I feel like I need to apologize to Andy Steinberg because he has heard this presentation more times he can count over a period of years. So you can tune out or, or probably give it in your sleep. Um, but I, so Tracy, would this be um, new information for most of the committee members? No, I mean, I no. think, so, we, I mean, most of us were on the committee last year and we okay. did, we were not asked to weigh in officially. Right. On but I don't need to proposal. start at the beginning then. I mean, the issue about Lincoln and like park safety on Lincoln, I've lived in Amherst 20 years. It's come up for 20 years and well, there. 
there have been many different iterations of proposals. <laughs> so we, we've also had um, back in the old days, we had when this was the other committee, we had um, people from um, Lincoln come and talk about parking. And we're all very familiar because I've also brought the topic up to the thank you. Yeah. So come um, to the TAC, Kim. I remember when I first got on the TAC and we were meeting in person pre-COVID, yeah. like we did have um, residents of Lincoln yeah. come mm -hmm. to that meeting at the police station oh, yeah. room and That's they right. talked about That's their right. concerns. Yeah. So. yeah. Okay. so I should probably apologize to Gilbert. Gilbert too. He's heard this more times. But so um, where we left off with the last council and um, I, I wasn't on the council the last term, but the district three councilors at the time uh, Dorothy Pam and George Ryan um, brought the matter to the town council and it went before town services and organ and outreach. Um, and it, and this was the request. There is now no parking on either side of Lincoln because Lincoln is a, is a major through street from Amity and Route 9 onto campus. Um, it's a connector road, which is it has been determined by uh, DPW really not to be wide enough to accommodate two-way traffic and a lane of parking, which is what it currently has. So during weekdays during the school year between McClellan and Amity on the east side of the street, there's really like bumper to bumper parking, um, you know, between like nine to five, again, weekdays during the academic year and almost no parking when it's not the academic year. So, so Jennifer, not to interrupt, yeah. but would you like to, or I can, one of us could pull up the map that was in the TSO packet from last time, just so people get a visual. Sure, if you want to, I don't um, okay. have the ability to share it. Okay, that's fine. Right, so um, currently they've, uh, over the years, they have adopted some parking restrictions from uh, North Hadley Road, right? Which would be the Southern border of the university going to McClellan Street. And there is no parking during the weekday from nine to five on either side of the street on those like two and a half blocks. And the thought was that if parking was restricted there, that people uh, wouldn't park further that, you know, on the other side going south of McClellan because it would be so far from campus. But that hasn't proven to be the case. There's, there's now parking from McClellan to Amity. Yeah, so you can see it. The red lines are where there's currently no parking. And trying to, I can't see that so well. And we are, there is a, the parking issue is between McClellan and Amity on the east side of the street. So it's not only impeding traffic because the traffic has to stop going in one direction to allow cars coming from the other direction to go around the parked cars, but it's becoming hazardous and problematic for the residents on that side of the street because they all have narrow one car driveways and the cars are parking right up to the curb cuts to the driveways and often they'll even overhang the curb cut. So it's the sight lines are blocked for the cars to pull in and out of the driveway. And there's been a, at least a couple of instances where an emergency medical vehicle couldn't pull into the driveway because the cars were parked so close to the curb or overhanging the curb cut and there wasn't space for the vehicle to go into the driveway. And then because there were so many cars parked on the street, the vehicle was finding itself having to park, you know, like almost a block away. So it's both a, a traffic uh, inconvenience for traffic and, um, and a, a visual sight line um, impediment for the residents. And we've requested if the curb, you know, the residents have requested if the curbs could be painted maybe two or three feet on either side of the curb cuts to the driveway, but that's not actually something that the town does because it requires then vigilant enforcement and then maintenance of those lines. So it's, we have, it is, so for the last council, when they went, they went to TSO and DPW did a, a study and the recommendation was that they, um, not allow parking on the east side of Lincoln between McClellan and Amity from eight to five weekdays during the academic year. And it, um, it, 
The TSO, a majority of TSO voted to refer that recommendation to the town council. And then really the, I think like the day before it was going to the town council for a vote where it tied 6-6, six, six, um, a couple of councilors were changed their vote because they heard that there are two new dormitories being built um, at Lincoln Avenue and Massachusetts Avenue. So basically where at the, about two and a half blocks from where we're requesting that the parking be restricted, they're in the process of building two new dorms and they, last November, they blocked off the intersection at Lincoln and Mass Avenue um, for the construction. The dorms will be open in fall 2023. And that some, a couple of the counselors thought, well, let's, before we restrict parking, let's see what happens when they close off that intersection, because it may mean cars aren't coming down the street and aren't parking there. But our experience has been since, although they've closed that intersection to through traffic to campus, it's open to pedestrian and bicyclists. So that hasn't changed cars parking on Lincoln between McClellan and Amity at all, because you can park and still walk to campus. And then we've just recently been informed that when the new dorms open, that intersection will open again. So it's not permanently closed. And once again, Lincoln Avenue will be the major through street going north and south, you know, from Amity and Route 9 onto campus. And it feels even more um, pressing that we, you know, um, implement some level of parking management on the street because we are about to, in fall again, 2023, have 800 new residents move to the corner. There's two dorms, an undergraduate dorm, which I think is gonna have like 603 and maybe uh, beds, and then a graduate uh, residence, which will have about 200. So that's a huge influx of residents and drivers onto the street. I think Tracy um, recently told me that the average, they figure, what is it, a 0.5 spaces per residence. So, I mean, we could be looking, 0.5 cars, excuse me. So we could be looking at 800 residents with 400 cars, maybe a hundred of whom would have be able to access spaces on campus. So um, the, the, the situation we've been facing for the last many years is about to get much more critical. So that's why we, um, I came at the request, I don't live on the part of Lincoln, I might add where this, um, between, I don't live between McClellan and uh, Amity, but the residents who live there um, this that's almost a number one priority. So I brought it to the council who referred it to TSO and then TSO met last week. And um, it, it was terrific that Tracy was in, in the audience and they asked why this uh, matter hadn't been referred to TSO in the past and asked if TSO might be able to, you know, weigh in or you know, offer an opinion. Right, Jennifer, they asked about TAC. What did I just say? TSO. No, I'm sorry. It's fine. I'm sorry. No, it's fine. No. It's all good. Yeah. So just to, I mean, yeah. so just to clarify one thing, I mean, I'm on the street almost every day. You know, I live nearby and my office is at UMass is on Mass Ave. But so one thing is, and I have used Lincoln, I will admit it as a cut through street sometimes. But so one thing that has happened, I mean, when I've been on, you know, when I've been driving, you know, towards campus and things, at first, you know, you have the impression when you get to fearing, oh, no, like there's all that construction ahead and you can't get through, but you can actually, and cars have figured this out, and I've seen an increase in traffic, and today, even in the, though it's the summer, there were quite a few cars, is that it is blocked off like here and so on, but you can actually go on North Hadley Road, which will bring you out to the street right next to the Southwest dorms, and then you come out on Mass Ave, and the only thing there is that you can only turn right. And so like if you could go right to Lincoln, you could turn right or left, but currently you can only turn right. But that doesn't mean that cars aren't doing that regularly. Right, so you can yeah. see that square. We this. can show them where the dorms are being built. Oh yeah, can we? So the dorms are being built here. So they're building, being well, built on- To the right also. Oh, they're to the right, oh, yeah, yeah. Right. all of that. Oh, right, all and also that. where there was the Lincoln apartments, which right. were much smaller density. So it looks to me, I don't know the building plans off the top of my head, but when I go by there, it looks like it's at least like four to five yeah. stories yeah, at least. on Mass Ave, very close. And I think they tried to put the highest buildings away from the neighborhood. Um, but one thing is that, right, this is being built on an existing parking lot. 
as somebody who works on this section of Mass Ave, and I mentioned this at TSO, that my, the, you know, the staff who are in that area, a lot of them have been moved off of where they were parking because we were, people were parking in this lot. <laughs> and so that's no longer available, right? Um, and most of my colleagues, we have some other remote locations and most of them will not come to our Mass Ave offices. They say that it's just way too inconvenient. Um, so with these new dorms, it's actually, according to what UMass has shared, it's 824 beds, including the 623 for undergrads and the 201 for grad students. And the Jennifer's, I mean, the information that I've seen from the, and from the meetings from UMass is that UMass has typically traditionally estimated that um, 0.5 parking spaces per bed. Um, they have not updated that 0.5 since COVID. I don't know if that number has changed. I would be interested to find that out just in case, because for example, like right last school year, there were more students bringing cars to campus than ever before. So it might be even a little higher. So what um, the UMass people have said in the meetings that I've seen and heard about, and George Ryan had reported on some of them too, is that when the dorms open, which is expected for the fall 2024, that there will be 100 parking spaces on site, like right there. Um, but even though so they will be providing, you know, the 400 parking spaces based on the 0.5 estimate, um, but the other spaces will not be there. Like, so a bunch of them will be on the other side over here, where like next to, you know, along University Drive where there's a lot more parking and things and other students will be distributed elsewhere. So they're not quite as convenient. Um, and so that's what I had heard. Anyway, um, thank you. So. Yeah, and, and um, this committee has certainly discussed um, the dangers of uh, for for cycling on that road as well, because no longer and and even for crossing the streets there, because when the cars are parked there, it's you, you then have to you can't, you know, you can't see down the road in either direction. So crossing is more hazardous. And certainly um, cycling is more hazardous with um, with all the cars on there as well. So, and, and I know anecdotally, um, there was something mentioned about buses, but I actually, um, at, for a while, I was driving my children to, to school at the same time. And yeah, I have actually seen buses wait and be delayed <laughs> because of not being able to get through that whole section of road. Um, I've seen it multiple times, so um, it does cause some issues. Yeah, I mean, so one one issue that's come up, you know, and if you look at the guidelines from DPW and so on, right, that the road width is not sufficient to continually have like two lanes, two travel lanes, one in each direction. Hi, Dorothy, good to see you. Um, two traveling in each direction plus one traveling in each direction plus the on street parking. Um, and which, I mean, I think that's right. I mean, I think what, I mean, in my experience, and I don't know what data DPW and the town may have, but really so much of the traffic there is related to UMass. And so after hours with UMass or, partic you know, over, particularly like over the summer and so on, that there really isn't, um, there, there, there are very few times when you're going to see like two lanes of traffic continually. And even, even at the UMass peak times, like so much of the traffic is about UMass, right? So like, for example, in the mornings, a lot of the traffic is going towards the campus, you know, in the afternoon, a lot of the traffic is going away from the campus. Um, it came up at TSO and people said, well, if it's not safe to have parking there, you know, from eight to five, like, why would it be safe to have parking there other times? And my you know, gut response to that is I look at like other streets that, you know, where, you know, other thoroughfares where during commuting hours, they say you can't have on-street parking, but during other times of the day you can and things. And so I, it doesn't seem that there would be a conflict where if during the off-peak hours, you did allow parking. From my perspective, but again, I don't live. I mean, I live on Blue Hills, right? I don't live on Lincoln. I just walk on Lincoln a lot. So, um, did anybody want Christine? Did you have comment or um, Stefan had a comment? 
Oh, you can go ahead first. I actually just had the precise question that Tracy <laughs> answered. Mm -hmm. So I took my hand oh, up. Thank okay. you. Yep, Jennifer's next, I think. I just wanted to kind of echo what Kim said is, um, a couple of residents have said that the school bus actually had to change its approach to the street because um, he was getting behind schedule, having to stop and let you know traffic coming from the other direction pass. So you're right about that. That observation mm -hmm. was um, you know actually uh, problematic. It, it was the the cars parked were causing enough of a delay that it was um, problematic for the school bus driver. Thank you, Dorothy. Pardon me for being late. We've just driven back from Boston where my husband got a one bandage off his foot and a new hard cast put on. Um, I want to say the question of whether there should be any parking on Lincoln or none at all is, is an interesting question. So my suggestion is that we go with the uh, proposal, the formal proposal that DPW gave, which is to restrict parking to non-business non hours to have parking allowed on the street. Uh, I guess it's after five till maybe eight in the morning, something like that. And then see how that goes. If there are still problems, then one could consider that there should be no parking at any time on Lincoln. But I, rather than go all the way to that in one step, I would say, why not do it in um, two steps and do the official proposal from uh, DPW and um, have no parking there. And we'll see how that, that goes. And we'll also take a look to see about bike safety and other things. Um, one thing that, that does perturb me when we discuss this, the question of how will this affect other roads, other streets always comes up. And I think, well, you know, we don't know, but we do know how it affects people on Lincoln Avenue. And I keep thinking, why is that not important? Why doesn't that count? Why is some, somehow, that it's Lincoln Avenue, when we know it's a major, major road direct to the university um, and an important road. And when you when I've, I've used Sunset as an alternative since when Lincoln's closed at the top, you don't really, it's kind of hard to get into. It's got that weird little divided thing in the middle of the road and you're not quite sure how to go. And um, it's just, it's, people don't take that road, that street, I don't know why. Would they change in the future? We would find out. So I'm, I'm just, really strongly advocating that we uh, listen to what residents have said and follow the recommendation of uh, Guilford Mooring and the DPW that we go for the uh, no parking on the east side of the street between, uh, is it eight or nine and five, I think it is. Yep. Um, okay. And go with that. So that's, that's my comment. Thank you. Thank you, Pam. And I think Guilford is next and then Stefan. Just a quick comment. Um, the proposal you're looking at, which is being called the DPW proposal, is the consensus proposal that came out of the TSO and everybody meeting. The DPW, if it had its way, would say no parking and just leave it as that. So please just call it the proposal or something else, but don't tag it to us, please. Okay. Noted. Stefan? Yeah, uh, just to kind of piggyback on what Dorothy was just mentioning. I think just looking at it, even a softer approach instead of restricting it entirely. And again, this is just, a, I would just consider this as a pilot just to see how it goes, not again, an end all be all. Um, but I think that looking at it as more of a time restricted uh, thing. Okay. So, you know, you can only park for one hour, two hour, three hour um, versus an eight to five or between those times, you can only park for two hours is what I'm saying. Um, I think that might be just, again, just as a trial. And then if that doesn't work and we're having the same issues, uh, I don't think they'll be worse, but I think if you're having the same issues and it, you don't see any change, then go to a whole don't park eight to five. The only thing I, with, and I, I this is actually mentioned in uh, Jennifer's uh, memo, which I read earlier today of this uh, towards the bottom, I think of the memo I mentioned that the approach that I just said, um, the only th concern I would have with the approach that I'm just suggesting now is because UMass is so massive and I, you know, I go down Lincoln a lot to cut through. I'm guilty of it as well. Uh, and I know classmates, you know, when I went to UMass, who would actually park. Uh, some people came as far as new, from New Hampshire. Who lived, I had a, um, in grad school, there was someone who lived in New Hampshire and he would come and park all day there um, and then walk. And I know a lot of people do that. So um, with an issue with like UMass, you know, a massive school, 
the whole two hour only approach might not really fly only because when someone does leave, someone's going to be there right to take the spot. Um, so I think it's going to be continuously full, the street. So that's the only kind of concern I would have about that. But I just figured taking a more like, uh, you know, instead of step one to four, just go to the second step and try to do this. And then if it doesn't work, then go to a whole, you know, you can't park there at all, eight to five. Um, and that was, oh, and then the last thing I'll say, um, so I mentioned a few minutes, a few minutes ago is um, with the painting of the, the curb cuts, uh, I know it was mentioned that that's going to involve enforcement and that the town uh, either can't or doesn't want to do that. The only question I'd have about that is if, if we do, if we, if we do put up signs saying you can't park here during these times, either for two hours or at all, that's still going to have to be enforced. So if you're enforcing that one way, I don't really see the big deal in, in looking at if someone's too close to curb because I think if you don't paint these lines people are just going to put the bumper of the car aligned with the curb cut so I think you still have the excuse me you're still gonna have to have this you're still going to have this issue of EMS vehicles uh garbage trucks what what have you service vehicles not being able to access driveways uh if we don't do this that really if you're going to be enforcing anyway the parking signs you might as well just do the paint because you're going to be there anyway enforcing it so that's all I have to say about that thank you Sorry, before the next speaker, um, Eve just uh, came as an attendee. Can we let her into the room, please? To be a thing. Um, I think Jennifer is next. Um, thank you. So um, I, this may be what uh, Christine was going to respond to. So I, if you were, I, I will uh, certainly you, you know defer to you to explain it much better than I could. But I think the two hour parking when that was suggested, the concern again was that it was just gonna be very uh, labor intensive for the town to enforce that. Yeah. But I, at the TSO meeting, I know I, you know, share Dorothy's position of, you know, why it was maybe overkill to say no parking ever since it's between eight and five weekdays during the academic year when it's problematic. But I did, did have this question for Guilford and I wouldn't take up too much of the committee's uh, time with this, but. Do you think because of the new dorms that we're going to find that parking, there's demand for it now, you know, kind of 24 seven? Um, you, we now have demand for on street parking 24 seven because the town council did away with the overnight parking ban, which was from November until April. And that kind of made people who live in town know they had to have a safe place to park. Um, at night, I mean, they didn't. We didn't tow every night, but during a snowstorm, we definitely did tow. So now they know they can kind of stay there, and there's no risk to being towed at all unless we declare a parking ban. Um, so people were just, people are now just garaging their cars on the in, on the streets. So that's going to stay as long as you have, as long as you can park overnight on the street. Yeah. Um, so that's there's two really separate things. Parking, uh, the I don't know how much UMass has been saying this, but the plant the plan at UMass is to actually build a couple of parking garages, and I don't know where they have them in their schedules. They are in their master plan. If you look at the master plan, they have several new parking garages, and um, so they should technically be taking care of the parking problem, but. The timeline is what I don't know, or probably they're not talking about. And Guilford, and yes. And do you know where those are slated to be? Any additional parking garages? Uh, there, there's actually, I think there were two slated in this area. The, uh, the ground lot that's left to the west and the ground lot that's to the east were supposed to be parking garages. Oh. If you look at their master plan, because I know I pushed back at TSO hard against the total ban, but in thinking about it since then, you know, I'm, you know, wondering if maybe we should think about that. But I don't know. So, I mean, one question I had, so there have been concerns, right, about banning parking completely. Um, like if we, you know, and I do want to pull up the map again, because there are some streets that I do have concerns about, like spillover demand. Um, it is, you know, worth noting too that 
right? So Amherst is changing its whole downtown parking permit policy, right? That the rates went up a lot, as, especially for people who um, don't uh, register their car in Amherst. Like it's going to be up to like 400 something a year. And otherwise it's going to be 100 something, which is not huge, but it's, it's five times what it is currently. And so Lincoln, if you're coming from downtown, Lincoln is like the first street that doesn't have any like permit parking. So and the permit parking means you have to have a downtown parking permit to park in those spaces during the workday. And then otherwise those spaces are available to everybody. So like we saw that right on North Pleasant Street near Kendrick Park. And then like all the way over to like Fearing and all the connecting streets. But then by when you get to Lincoln, it's not, you don't have that anymore. Um, so I think, you know, there's already, there is already some of this demand for Lincoln. I always worry the most, and I did remember you know, a few years ago. So this, the last proposal from the council, like it came to a vote in December of 2021 before the last council finished up. But it actually originated, I think, in sometime in 2020 or 2019. Um, when George Ryan and Dorothy Pam were working on it and they worked through a number of different iterations. And I do remember speaking and I wasn't, or even maybe before I was even on the tack, but I do remember speaking um, to TSO then about just one concern that I always have is just the safety about the sight lines with both the cross streets and with the driveways. Um, and and that's what we hear too, like when we did have, as Kim said, when we did have people from Lincoln come, that was always one of their concerns too. And Jennifer's talked about how with emergency vehicles and things, if the cars do choose to park, and this happens too on North Pleasant Street, right near Kendrick, that's one reason that mm -hmm. I was pushing to push the parking to the park side and not the driveway side, because mm -hmm. there are cars that will not just park up to the driveway, but like into the driveway, infringing on the driveway, and some of the driveways aren't very wide. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, as a somebody who's worked on driving safety and things like that's always a major hazard, you know, and that's a hazard for like kids on the driveway and bikes and I mean, just not being able to see. I mean, that's always one of my big concerns. Um, now it has come up at some meetings that like, I guess it's under like state law or, I mean, are there any statutes or anything Guilford or like rules relating to how far away from, um driveways and things that cars are allowed to park the like, police have, the police say say there are um but they won't enforce it unless there's signage oh so as they will they enforce it in this so at the street intersections because i think that they the town has expanded the mm -hmm. setbacks with the street intersections to have like a wider sight line to there um, and it seemed like they're all signed now, like all along Lincoln for the streets, but you're saying there is stuff with drivers, but it's not enforced. So, I mean, if, I mean, it seems like, so if people are having issues with that and they call the police, you're saying the police aren't able to like ticket or enforce or give warnings or. Do they, they, I mean, I don't know. Okay. I mean, because I guess that was a question that came up, right? So like Jennifer gave that example of like an ambulance that couldn't get into the driveway because the people like the surrounding cars had parked too closely. Like if, if it, I mean, of course you would need a very rapid police response in that instance, but even if there was one, can the police like require somebody to move or ticket them or something like that? Or... So if, if you want to recommend that you, we actually sign every driveway um no. or between every driveway that that's no parking we we would prefer as a dpw we would prefer that over going out and paying the curbs Pay, paying the curb is a problem because when the winter comes you don't see it unless you remove the snow when we do the parking spaces downtown the lane the parking lines are longer or wider than the car so those usually are plowed and you can see those because they get plowed, but curb, the curbing doesn't get plowed. So that's why we don't like to paint the curbing as one is it's, you have to do it every year and half the year when there's snow on the ground, it's not visible. So then, then what are you using? If you use a sign post and you say no parking between the sign post, and that just happens to be on the other side of the driveways, that's easier 
that's an easier way to make sure it's known. Um, if you want to paint parking lines like there are in other sections of town, that's easier to make sure they're seen year round as well. Yeah, I'm just going to pull it up again, but I, it seems to me, I mean, it's nice of the DPW to offer to do that with the signage, but it seems like there are so many driveways, right? So like, it just, it seems like a lot of work and it's, it's, D, 35, D, it's, go it's ahead. 35, it's 35 signposts and 35 oh. signs. Oh, if you were going to sign every driveway on Lincoln? Yes. Wow. Okay. It just, it just requires someone give us, I mean, that's not in the budget to pay for. So no. there would have to need to be some money for paying for it. Andy and Dorothy have their hands up. Andy? Yes. Um, the one thing that I thought about and, uh, to ask Gilford is whether it would be valid to uh, ask the police department for some input, because it's possible that a single sign at the, in each major intersection coming into a street notifying people that they cannot uh, park within a certain distance of a driveway would be sufficient, that we would not have to do that at every house. Uh, because uh, the purpose of the, what the police are concerned about is ticketing when there's been no notice. And uh, I think that if uh, TAC would like that answer, somebody needs to check with the police department to see if that's possible as, a, um, as an alternative. Um, and I want to... Uh, just say one other thing, since I'm in the liaison position, we're in somewhat of an awkward position here because uh, the committee liaison rules are very clear for the council that um, we are not to um, express our opinion about the action that a committee is taking because we want to preserve your independence as the Transportation Advisory Committee to do your work. And uh, so it's a little bit awkward um, and I think probably needs clarification from the council side about um, what to do with district councilors, two of whom are present today because of their interest as district councilors, whether that places them in a different position. Um, but uh, it, it is a lack of clarity within council rules. And so uh, as liaison, I would encourage you to uh, consider, you know, listen to the opinions of um, district councilors, but remember that you are the committee and that um, the rules are to seek your opinion. So thank you. Yeah, um, Andy, I mean, I want to take Bruce's question um, comment, but I just to speak to that briefly. So I invited um, Councillor Todd to come here because it was her proposal that went to TSO and I wanted to hear, I mean, she would know better than any of us about what went into that proposal and thinking. And so, but um, I think you do bring up some good points. So thank you. Yeah, no, I, I, I'm not <coughs> questioning that, nor am I questioning their expressing their opinion but I uh, want to encourage you as a committee to perform your function as the Transportation Advisory Committee and not feel that you are being influenced uh, because, uh, and I'm saying that as the liaison. Thank you. Um, I think Dorothy had her hand up next and then um, Bruce. <laughs> So I do have a couple of points. I agree with Andy that the liaison position is an awkward one, which is why I at present refuse to be an official liaison because we were told as a liaison, you cannot express your opinion. Um, <laughs> but the fact that I'm a district three counselor um, is interesting because I don't, as I'm you know, using an analogy, I'm a woman and I feel I can make comments about women's rights and about the abortion law without having to say, well, I can't really talk about because I'm a woman, I'm an interested party. Yes, I'm an interested party. But I want to clarify something with Guilford. Um, when you said, if we painted parking lines, you know, the parallel lines showing where the parking places were up and down the street, 
did you say that would be sufficient? Um, so if somebody's parking really crazy over the parking line into a driveway, would that be sufficient without the individual signs that you were describing? Can't hear you, Guilford. We can't hear you, Guilford. I'm gonna share my screen with you. Yep. So this is Churchill and this area is for permanent parking and the spaces are painted like this. This is how we paint them. So when you plow, you can still see them. So that, that, is, that is something that is acceptable to the police. It's permanent parking. If people park over those little lines, they give them tickets. Um, from the standpoint of workload, it's actually easier to just have us install a sign and hopefully it lasts two or three years. Whereas we tend to paint these lines every year. Mm -hmm. So signs would be our number one choice, but this is this this is used now in other places in town to demark to keep people away from driveway entrances and roads. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, you. You don't they're not parallel lines. They're these little um, V lines. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, it's a little mark that says park between this line and the next line, which is over here. That's oh, okay. Over. Okay, I see that. Okay, right. Okay, well, that, that sounds like an interesting um, possibility. Um, so so just for a clarification on that, though, you wouldn't, I mean, it would be a lot of these little markings if you were going to do it at each driveway, right? Oh, yeah. So, yeah. Every year. I mean, I would be hesitant about that, just knowing how many other lines there are to paint for bike lanes and crosswalks. And I mean, there's a lot of maintenance that DPW is already doing. So, and as you pointed out, like in the snow, you can't see those anyway. Well, the, the snow plow comes down the road and uncovers okay. these. They don't uncover the ones on the curb. Um, Bruce? Yes, I, I would be in favor of a 24 hour ban on parking if safety is a concern. But my question was, it seems to me that at a meeting a long time ago, there was concern expressed about apartment dwellers on that street who need overnight parking on the street or visitors to uh, homeowners on the street who might need to park on the street. So I don't know if the two counselors could answer that question. Are, are, are there neighbors there who actually want overnight parking because they either live in apartments and they don't have a parking space in the driveway or they're a homeowner who wants to be able to have guests come and, and park someplace? I mean, I mean, if it's okay, I can speak to that briefly. I mean, there's very little on-street parking. Um, most of the parking, you know, is day parking, except for as some people have indicated, like people are using it as like their garage and they park there for multiple nights, but they don't live. I mean, there are driveways like on every property. Well, yeah, it doesn't but, seem to be a big issue. But certainly when people have parties and whatever. Oh, for sure. Are yeah, parking on the absolutely. Street, so. Um, you know, that's really what the parking had been on the street prior to it becoming a parking garage. It had been, you know, the, um, landscapers or, um, you know, whoever was coming to service a house or the guests, you know, weekend guests or, or late night guests or whatever parking on the street. So, um, Jennifer. Yes, I just wanted, I guess, to also reiterate what Andy was saying is um, we, the uh, TSO asked, it got, it was referred to TAC because they want your counsel and your input. So yeah, we don't, um, Dorothy and I aren't here as a council liaison, but to present, you know, the proposal and the problem that we're trying to solve, but we definitely want, um, or TSO, which I'm, I'm not a member of TSO, wanted, um, you know, your, your input and your thoughts, which is why um, it got to your agenda. Okay, Christine, and then I'll speak. Yeah, I just want to unpack a little bit of um, what might the choice be for a, a student living in one of these new dorms, if there aren't any um, garages you know, being built at the same time. So um, 
their choice right now would be to buy a town permit at 400 and park somewhere else, or currently they could garage their car entirely at Lincoln, right on down the street, or they would have to pay the university some amount of money to be able to park you know, uh, yes, there are currently two. Um, so I two parking garages on either. Or I'm sorry, two parking lots on either side. And I just like price wise, how much is that? And I'm just trying to understand what a calculation would be for a student living in one of those new dorms. Um, I don't. I don't know what the rates are for next year. I haven't looked at it yet. The year is the school calendar year like the school calendar year right so it starts okay. their year-round passes I mean they start in September they go to August the university also does allow you to get summer permits which is something I looked into for my job um, students who live in the dorms they are not eligible for the downtown permit passes because those aren't town streets you know they're not living near the downtown they're living on the campus so if they were to bring cars to campus um and they're living on campus you know they would be looking for on-campus parking um and as i was saying like the the umass calculates that it's like usually 0.5 parking spaces are needed per bed and so that's a total of about 400 parking spaces um and they are providing 100 on site there and then there will be the, there will be other parking made available to the students too just like in all the other dorms, but in some cases, the parking lots that the students are assigned to is not very close to where they live. Like I remember an editorial last year from a student at UMass who like lived in a dorm like up the hill, not far from your house, Christine, and but they were assigned to like a parking lot across campus, for example. So um, I believe, I mean, I believe the university is planning to provide at least the 0.5 parking spaces per bed. So. Right. Um, and so, so I have a question, I guess my hand is still up and I'll lower it. So one of the questions I had, and you know, this has come up to just about, you know, the right of people to park near their properties. And if you look here, um, sorry, I'll reshare the map, uh, again, right. So the, the idea, I mean, I generally support, and I think we do want to move forward and like have a motion on this. Um, but you know, if you look here, I mean, there are these other streets like very close to UMass, the red means no parking at all right now, right? So there is no parking on most of Fearing. The only parking allowed on Fearing is like the UMass parking meters that are like going down the hill to University Drive, right? And there's no parking on some of these other streets that are close to the university, all these red ones. And like, of course, Page and Beston, those are narrow streets. Um, so I did wonder, you know, just, and it's come up too, especially as the parking permit prices increase, you know, in terms of students looking for other parking around, I'm not, I didn't get a chance to go up to other neighborhoods that are also adjacent to the university. I do think it is a little bit of a unique situation to have like 800 beds, a dorm with 800 beds so close, like right on the border of a neighborhood, like a dense neighborhood. Um, but, you know, for like, for example, like um, up North Pleasant Street, like Hobart Lane and the other um, streets that are off of North Pleasant Street, north of campus, like do any of those have parking restrictions? Do they allow cars on one side of the street? Do they allow cars on both sides of the street? I also thought a little bit too about, though it's, you know, it's farther. I thought about Christine, your street, Christine Lindstrom, because you live on, what's your street called again? But there's parking allowed on your street too, right? On Butterfield one side of the Terrace. Yeah, uh, but there's parking on one side, I believe, right? No, there's oh, no okay. parking. No. Um, but then also, you know, even up to, I mean, for people who are, you know, willing to walk a little, like even potentially, I mean, students are pretty industrious about this stuff and will work to save money, but even up towards like off of East Pleasant Street, um, some of those those areas that like end at the fields between East Pleasant and North Pleasant. But um, I mean, one thing I find like on some of these smaller streets and even I see this a lot on Blue Hills Road is that when we do have times when there are cars parked on both sides of the street, 
which we are having more and more with accessory units and with people running businesses out of their homes and with people getting work done in their homes. I mean, we could not have school buses. You know, we have issues with school buses on our street. We have issues with garbage trucks. The issues are acerbated during the winter, you know, when there's snow and things. And so are there restrictions, Guilford, on some of those other neighborhoods that are close to UMass on the north end of campus? There, there are restrictions on those. Most of them are parking on either one side or no parking. Okay, so sort of with that in mind, and I'm, you know, as I looked at these maps that were presented at the TSO meeting last night, the ones I'm sharing again now, I was looking around this neighborhood and, you know, one thing that came up at TSO was sort of the issue about some of the spillover parking. So like one thing to me, right, you have all the red areas, but I was thinking, for example, about sunset. So from where I live and, you know, close to downtown, if I'm walking to campus, which I do often, right, for me, walking on Sunset is just as, as far away from campus as walking on Lincoln. And so, like, currently, if you look at this section of Sunset, this green section, that's completely unrestricted parking. Um, so, you know, one thing, we weren't asked to consider this by TSO, but just in terms of spillover effects, like, would it makes sense. And I know that this is something that was in the early version of the proposal that Dorothy Pam and George Ryan were working on. Um, would it make sense to, I mean, I can't, you know, sunset, when I look at it, it seems narrow. I haven't measured it, but it seems narrower than Lincoln. And so if all of a sudden, if, you know, Lincoln parking is restricted, and then again, you know, students are pretty industrious, people are pretty industrious, they, people may park on sunset more because it's basically the same distance you know, would it make sense to restrict parking on at least one side of the street on sunset? Because I would hate to get to a situation like where all of a sudden you have cars parking on both sides. And so you have had some spillover and you have transferred the issues from Lincoln to sunset. Because I feel pretty confident that if parking on Lincoln is restricted more, that there will be more people over here. Um, and I had the same sort of question just about Elm Street too. You know, Elm Street only has a couple driveways on it, but again, like currently, well, the parking is just prohibited Monday to Friday, you know, during the day, but why do we have to allow parking on both sides of Elm? I would rather restrict parking on one side of the road up front, and then we won't ever have a situation where there are cars parking on both sides of Elm at off peak times, and then it's harder for cars to get through, so. I mean, those are my those are my questions to the committee. If people agree with that, you know, if we think there's issues, if we restrict on one side of the street, I think sort that's of proactively, a very, very salient point. I didn't. I mean, especially oh. Elm and um, and Sunset. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Um, but is, so the, go ahead, Kim. I think that it seems like you know. Um, because we are getting toward the end of our meeting, um, we should, as a committee, um, start to come to co some kind of um, consensus. Um, and and I guess I am just gonna throw this out there that, I mean, I, I feel like um, restricting parking, particularly um, between, you know, normal working hours, um, seems like um, the prudent thing to do um, along Lincoln, at least as a test, um, both, you know, for mainly for safety reasons. Um, and yeah, there might be spillover in the evenings. I mean, who knows? It's a wild card with the dorms coming in. But um, what we do know is that there are real safety issues from between, you know, eight and five. <laughs> um, we've all experienced that and as have the residents. So um, to me, and, and this is something we've all, we have discussed in this committee before as well. Um, so um, that's, I think that's where I'm landing. Yeah, and I would I would be interested in hearing from other committee members who have because because I think um, as Stefan was mentioning, you know, the two hour thing, which, um, you know, 
I, I'm not sure who that would necessarily serve. And, um, and you're right. I mean, especially with the new dorms coming in, I think we should just try um, the no parking nine to five. But um, yeah, Bruce. I would second that. Thank you. If you're Thank making you. a motion. Yeah, I can, I mean, I can put it in a motion form, but did any other committee members? And Dorothy, um, just to clarify too, when is the TSO meeting again? Like, when would you be taking this up? Oh, we can't hear you, you're muted. I have misplaced my uh, address and so let me go look in the door where I keep a calendar. I'll be right back. <laughs> so do any other committee members want to chime in while well, Christine has Christine Lindstrom has a hair hand up, please be heard. Yeah, I'm a little bit more, I guess, um, feeling more hardcore and sort of leaning towards just an overall ban and, um, you know, with concerns about Elm and Sunset as well. And, you know, doesn't mean that the safety issues that occur between eight and five can't happen at other times. So why not just make it safe? Um, but um, so that said, I, I guess I would support um, the ban between eight and five during the academic year for sure, um, even though it's not my leaning, um, it's more of a compromise. And I would just want to, if there's a way to write into our recommendation that it's just, you know, our recommendation maybe stands for a year. Mm. And we do want to revisit um, once the dorms are built and we have some understanding of how, you know, that situation shakes out in terms of impact on the neighborhood, because I can see, we just don't know. And um, we might want to, react even more, um, you know, aggressively with uh, parking bans, depending on how things work out with the students there. Yeah, yeah. I, I agree with yeah. you. Yeah. So, I mean, so one thing is if we do an eight to, eight to five ban, like a weekday ban, it would be a year round ban, which yeah. I, I'm okay with that. It would be a year round ban, eight to five. So it sounds like, um, we could make a motion saying, um, I'm sorry, Christine Press up. Christine you have a has comment? her hands up. Yeah. yeah. I just wanted to note that someone mentioned before that the dorms weren't actually going to be occupied until the fall of 2024. So do you want to extend your experimental mm -hmm. period until 2023? I think it know. is 2023. Oh, who said? Sorry, I might have said 2024. I was misspoken. It is 2023. Okay, 2023. All right. Thank right. You. In one year. Yeah. All right. Thanks. So, My apologies. So, um, well, but still, you're not going to get to the dorms being open. Right. If you oh, in that one year. And like one so year it would no, year. absolutely. Year. So yes. you should probably go for 18 months or 24 months. That's and I mean, and also like, as we've noted, it's already an issue now, right? So it's like some people had thought that there wouldn't be a problem that wouldn't have the traffic, but we're mm -hmm. still having a lot of that happening. So it's probably won't get better, you know, <laughs> unfortunately, so. And um, Dorothy is asking, has her hand up? Yes, um, you were asking me when the TSO meeting is. Now, we have a lot of things on the upcoming agendas. I can't swear to it, but we do have a meeting on the 21st of July. And I think we wanted to have this thing ready by the start of the semester. So I think, um, I, this is not definitive, but there's a very good chance that Lincoln Avenue parking could be on the TSO agenda for July 20. Well, yeah, I mean, what I'm feeling like from our discussions and things is that we could make a motion today right. yeah. um, and that it would be supported by TAC. And then I can write up a memo. Um, we wouldn't, the TAC would not be meeting again, you know, before the 21st, mm -hmm. um, but I can circulate it as we have done before. Yeah. If Kim is fine, she yeah. can like edit it. We'll keep yeah. it short and raise the issues that we've raised. Yeah. Um, so I would make a motion to say that we support um, prohibiting um, parking on Lincoln on that section that Jennifer had requested, the one that's currently allowed, which is the McClellan to Amity section. East side. Um, the, the east side. The, the east side, because yeah. the west side, it's already banned. So we would support prohibiting it from eight to five. 
um, Monday through Friday. And so our motion is we we support or you know we would recommend to the council that Lincoln Avenue in that section Monday through Friday eight to five um, parking be prohibited and that parking also be prohibited on uh, permanently like twenty four seven on um, one side of Sunset from elm to amity where it's currently allowed i would suggest prohibiting it on the um east side personally because there's fewer driveways there but it can be up to the committee i mean there's more driveways there um and then also on elm street on one side okay. so and, and um and is uh, before we um take a vote there are there is there any other discussion Okay. Yes, Christine. Well, just I would, you know, and and then as including a revisit after yes, eighteen or twenty-four months. Um, yes. Once the dorms are populated, right. cars are there, and we can see how what impact it's having, and that and, the street is reopened all the way. So. Right. Yep. And Stefan has a comment. Yeah, I'll, I'll make this quick. Um, and then what is the enforcement mechanism for this going to be? Are we, uh, I, I know Guilford talked about signs earlier, signposts, and then it'll be easier long-term maintenance than painting. Um, is that the way we're leaning, uh, even for this trial period with signs? I think that's an excellent point. My suggestion um, would be, okay, I just, it's, it still seems like a lot of labor to me. And so I guess mm -hmm. I would, I would not start with that as a first step, but we could put that in our notes that, you know, if it continues to be an issue, that that could be something that could be considered in the future. Like, how do we notify people? I guess what I'm saying is that like, when this enacts, how do we yeah. like- It has to be a sign. Somewhere. Right, some Gilford, Gilford says, yes, it has to be a sign, just like it oh, is- Oh yeah, no, there would have to be the, sign, the signs to prohibit the, the parking. Yeah. But yes. oh, I thought you were referring to like the driveways no. that Guilford offered to sign mm -hmm. all of those. Yeah. No, I mean, on the yeah, there would have- Yeah, it has to be a sign and there would also need to be, TSO will need to hold a public hearing. Anytime you're changing on street parking, there needs to be a public hearing. So they would need to hold one later this summer. Okay. And so um, property owners part. would be notified in advance. At like the start of the road, maybe midway, mm. and not every driveway, but just yeah, throughout the road. Okay, got it. Um, and Dorothy, do you have a comment? Yes. Um, the question of the public hearing prompted this. I believe that Lynn said we, that at our last TSO meeting, and um, Andy can use his memory on this. She said yes, we need a public hearing, and that maybe we would wait until UMass was back in session, so we could ask. Um, do, you, do you remember that, Andy? Because this is about the timing of the public hearing. Are we going to wait until UMass is back in session or go ahead and try to do it this summer? Oh. I think that the um, suggestion was, as you indicated, but the other piece to the public hearing was that uh, it's best to have a concrete proposal to take to the public hearing so that the public right. knows what it is that is being proposed and can offer their opinions about it. So um, if that is, if I'm correct in my recollection of what you said about that, and, I, and that is consistent with prior public hearings, both on the select board and the mm -hmm. council, uh, we would need to uh, clear the notice, of course, with the, uh, you know, Keith who's the clerk to the council. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think that we also would wanna have uh, agreement yeah. on what it is that is the preferred mm -hmm. solution so that uh, your this committee's input uh, happening promptly um, certainly would be helpful to move the process along regardless of this hearing question yeah i mean i think it's up to tso when you hold the hearing i know when we were when TAC last summer when we were asked to look at north pleasant street at kendrick park like it seemed like it would be better to have the public hearing actually when people are back parking on the street, you know, which doesn't happen much over the summer. It is the same with Lincoln. I mean, the only thing with that is that, um, so UMass, you know, is gonna start, the fall semester is gonna start after Labor Day, I believe, mm -hmm. um, which is a little later than it did this year. I mean, the only concern I would have and but again it's totally up to the tso when you have the hearing is that mm -hmm. like if we haven't implemented it um 
before school starts again right then in beginning in september like students and whoever else is coming mm -hmm. to umass they get into these patterns and these routines right. about where they're parking and so on there is also a lag time in terms of once a council it goes to the council so that there would be a public hearing it would come back to tso then it would go from tso to the council like how far into the fall would it take mm -hmm. before you actually could do like any enforcement i don't know guilford i mean in Gil Guilford, in your experience, like once, no, but once the council approves it, like how long does it take typically to order the signs and get the signs installed typically? We, we would probably just have the signs sitting on the shelf and oh, okay. you're ready to go. Um, and Dorothy. Yes. So the meeting on the 21st, we will take to consider tax recommendation. The committee will decide what it's position is. I think Andy is correct. As Lynn did say this and it makes good sense. Um, and we will firm that up and I can't tell you right now what exactly it will be, okay? But at that point, we then can announce a public hearing, which would be uh, a meeting in August, if we decide to go ahead then. And that same meeting that we have the public hearing, we would have the public hearing, then TSO would firm up what its response is after having listened to the public and form its it's a motion that it would send to the council. So that would probably be an early September meeting that it would go to the council. If th this is the fastest that we can go. Um, so that the, um, the next meeting that we meet, we would be considering TAC and then making our motion. Then we would use that when we call our, for our public hearing and combine that public hearing with a meeting in which we make our final decision of what we're gonna ask the council to do. Then the council has to act. And I mean, the public can still weigh in like all the way through the process, like at yes. the council, and also typically right at the council it comes to two council meetings, unless you waive that requirement. So it would be, I'm saying okay. there would be the month while the students are, you know, everybody's back. Mm -hmm. So people could weigh in one way or another, even if they weren't able to attend the public hearing in August when lots of people are on vacation right. and things. Right. right. Yeah, because the count, there is a desire to not have a town council meeting maybe after the 1st of August, if possible, just so that the, the town staff can take a break. So um, I do have a question. Did we ever take our motion, Kim? Um, no, but okay. we are in the period of discussion. Which no, absolutely, I understand. Okay, got the, it. Um, vote. Uh, Jennifer, did you have another comment? To make? Yeah, I don't know if it's appropriate, um, but no, as um, Andy said, since it was uh, suggested that we have a specific um, proposal before a public hearing, it would be very helpful to have tax okay. input because just like you just um, suggested, we consider one side of Elm Street and that east side of uh, Sunset between Elm and Amity. That would be very helpful to have because that then TSO may decide that that would be part of the proposal that's put out to the public before the hearing. So thank yep. you. Okay, and um, so thank you for that fruitful discussion. Um, um, can Tracy reiterate yeah. the um, motion, please? Okay, I will reiterate. So the main point of our motion was that we would recommend the following to the council, that the parking on Lincoln between McClellan on the west side of, sorry, on the east side of Lincoln between McClellan and Amity be prohibited Monday through Friday, 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. That the parking on Sunset on the east side of Sunset be prohibited between Elm and Amity, like all of the time. And the same with Elm Street, one side of Elm Street be prohibited all the time. And that also that the counts that this come back for reconsider, you know, for to revisit. Mm -hmm. Um, after the interim period, after the dorms are open and Lincoln is fully open again at Mass Ave within like an 18 to 24 month period. Great, okay. So with that motion all, and the previous discussion, all those in favor on the committee, please vote. And okay. that is a unanimous. Okay, decision. so that's five to zero, great. No dissent, so um, great. And so we passed passed um, that motion of restricting um, parking. Okay. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.
Now I know that we're almost at seven and we typically try to end after 90 minutes. Um, we don't have the meeting scheduled, you know, again for a whole month. Um, I, I, I don't really want to keep our meeting going very long. I know people are very busy. Um, but if there are any priority items people want to bring up, I guess I was mainly interested just to see, um, Christine and I are working on the safe routes to school information. Um, and I would like to wrap up whatever we're going to do, <laughs> whatever we're going to submit to the schools um, back, um, you know, by August. Um, would it make sense for, I mean, could the TAC have like a working meeting or a subcommittee meeting? We do have a, to discuss that. Do people yeah. feel comfortable with that? Could we do that on the 21st? On the you know, 21st of I know, July. Kim, you're not available no. then. Of July? Yeah, of July. I mean, how do people feel about that or? I'm available. I mean, the other option could be that Christine and I just work on it and we circulate it around and Kim or somebody collects comments mm -hmm. and we don't need to meet. I mean, it doesn't directly involve, ta you know, it's more about the schools, yeah. but we, because you've I mean, been part of the previous discussions, so. We do want to have some on-point recommendations and it would be helpful to have the group to do that. Um, <laughs> you know, just to, and then that helps us encourage the school district to move in a certain direction around, you know, improving signs and lines and right. other kinds of. So um, yeah. like Guilford, are you available on July 21st if we do have a TS, I mean, a TAC meeting that day? Possibly. <laughs> okay. I know that we had some questions for you too, so. Um, yeah, that's true. Or we could maybe have a meeting like a different day that week if you were available. Um, would, would any, I mean, so we can. Right, right now I'm available. Okay, great, thank you. Also remember it has to be posted, even though. It's no, we understand, we understand, yeah. yeah. Um, so Guilford, if we're doing it as a subcommittee meeting then we don't need to have like four members present, is that correct? No, but you okay. just still have no, to. No, we need it. to post it. I understand. Yeah. And so I think if we were, I, I feel good doing that meeting on the 21st, and okay. we'll just have that one main agenda item to focus on the safe routes to school. And um, we'll try to keep it short. Um, and we'll, we will, as Guilford said, we will advertise it. Um, and now, Guilford, can you just, I had missed this, or Andy, can you just clarify too, like what? I missed this part of the last council meeting about what are the rules currently with continuing remote meetings beyond July? Has the legislature taken any action on this? Yeah. Someone. Some, somebody Jennifer, who knows. Jennifer yes. seems to have I can, her. I can tell you. Christine. That, um, Christine. Yeah. Yes. One, of the two, one of the two houses, I think it's the Senate has taken action allowing remote meetings to go on through December of 2023, but I believe it has to go back to the house to be voted on, and then it has to go to the governor. So that's my understanding of the situation. Actually, the house passed something, right. but it is a very different and more comprehensive proposal than the Senate, so that the uh, difficulty of trying to conference between the two chambers is going to actually be more complicated and really press that deadline pretty hard and and uh, is the current deadline the end of this month is that correct no it's the middle of the month it's the 15th <laughs> the middle of the month like let next week <laughs> yes and okay. that's, what, that's what the uh, I see. problem is and i think that we really have no idea. I don't know if Jennifer's heard anything different, um, but uh, I think we have no idea um, how long that process will take and what the meaning is for those of us in Amherst, because we just heard this news today. And uh, typically we hear through the town manager and um, the town attorney about these kinds of issues. and. Uh, at this point, um, we're sort of at a loss ourselves as to what to schedule because I'm trying to schedule a joint uh, finance committee and council meeting for the 19th. And I just sent off uh, something this afternoon to um, Athena saying maybe we're going to have to post it both ways and hope that we get clarity and can stay with uh, 
a virtual meeting, um, but we yeah. we needed to um, do something. So that yeah, was I mean, so for TAC for the twenty first, I would be fine if our if our subcommittee needs to meet in person. Either way works. Um, but I mean, Guilford would would it would we can we check about like if there's a space that we could use at town hall or something if we did need to meet in person um it will just be a few of us we could even meet in one of the smaller spaces like um right the one time we met at the bit that room in the bank center or something if we had to do it that way um that'd be great if we could just check on that um okay and then just the one last item i would and then we do we are planning to have I'm assuming we are allowed to go back to remote meetings to have a meeting uh, the first Thursday in August, which is August 4th. Okay. And, it's, and if the TSO has anything more for us or anything, and okay. we'll continue with some of these other items. Um, the one last thing I was interested in for this meeting, just if we had, if Guilford just had a moment, because um, there had been discussion just about potentially hiring an intern who could work on the network maps. So I just wanted to see if Guilford had any update on that because I'm. Um, so do you have any update on that, Guilford? Yes. Okay, great. Update. Well, we your... met. We met with um. We met with the young lady and she okay. actually gave us a proposal to do the work. Oh, so great. We'll probably look it over and then go from there. All right. Great. Okay. Now, do we still need to? I mean, is the information that she would need to be able to work on the maps, is it already like put together and available or does that need to be pulled together? Including it's all the, over the place. Including the together. notes. Okay. Okay. All right. Thanks. So I'm, if like the, before the last meeting, I know she had read, you know, I've been in, I'm emailing her and you as well, as well as Mike Warner, who's the GIS coordinator, but I had gone through and like I had checked on which meetings we talked about it. I think there were like five or six meetings in early 2021 that we went through it. So, I mean, as a last resort, if we had to, we could always go back to, now that we have recorded meetings, we could always go back to that and revisit that. But so, but it'd be great to get her on board because I know that she is a grad student, right? And she's starting a new graduate program in the fall and the summer is going quickly, so. Great. So if there's anything we can do to help facilitate that getting underway, that would be awesome. So please let us know. Okay. Okay. Thank Thanks. Okay. That was my main. Any, did anybody else? I know we're at 706. Yeah. Did anybody else have any other items or? I move to adjourn. Thank you. All those All right. in favor. Thanks. Trace, All right. Trace, thank, Trace, you. Thanks, thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Good night, everybody. All right. Take Good care. Night. Good night. Good night.